Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video I'm going to uh, try to answer one of the Patreon questions about quasars, pulsars, blazers and other cool sounding objects. Let's talk about this and welcome to the math. Now, once in a while, I get a really interesting Patreon question, and um, this is one such request. One of the Patreons asked me to clarify, so what exactly is the difference between a quasar, a pulsar, a blazer, and other names that end with R? Well, actually, I don't really know of any other names except for, I guess, Radar. But I figured this was actually a really good question, because this has been asked many times on the line as well, and many people still don't really understand, um, so what exactly is a quasar, and what exactly is a pulsar, and why is it important? So let's actually start with the most unusual and the most difficult to understand, quasar. And all this starts back in the 1940s when the early astronomers realized that there was something really unusual all over the night skies. There were these super strange signals coming from pretty much every direction in night skies and a lot of these signals were radio signals. There were these really powerful radio emissions. And um, early attempts at explaining this involved pretty much everything, including of course aliens, and some scientists even thought that well maybe it's just essentially aliens, uh, very advanced aliens talking to each other. But uh, when they zoomed into those signals, when they actually took visual telescopes or um, optical telescopes and decided to look at where those signals are coming from, they saw, well, what seemed to be an unusual but relatively bright object similar to a star but not really a star. It took a few years to figure out what they're looking at, but they realized that it was actually a really faraway galaxy with a very, very active center in the middle. Today we refer to these as active galactic nuclei galaxies. One of the most famous such nearby galaxies um, that we sometimes use as an example or just to try to figure out what's going on in the rest of those galaxies is this right here. This is what it looks like in Space Engine, but if you were to look at this in uh, various spectra of light, radio light, UV light, um, X-rays, you would see something like this. This is a galaxy known as Centaurus A, and it's roughly around 13 million light years away from us, just past the so-called local group of galaxies, making this our nearest neighbor. And this galaxy does have a very active galactic nuclei, but it's not necessarily a quasar. It's almost a quasar. Quasars generally have even more energy coming from within them, and are so powerful that they literally stop the entire galaxy from being able to produce any more stars. The energy coming from within a quasar is usually responsible for creating extremely powerful winds uh, that kind of strip the galaxy of all of the gas as well, and they also produce really powerful gamma rays, suggesting that no life can technically exist inside a quasar. So, in other words, a quasar is just an extremely, extremely active galaxy. So active that it's literally like living next to a volcano. Basically, imagine an island where a volcano is constantly erupting. That's kind of a good analogy for what a quasar would be. But when it comes to quasars, there are several different ways of looking at them. Specifically, literally different directions. If you were to look at a quasar from the side, just like in this picture of Centaurus A, you wouldn't really see the emissions coming from the center. The astrophysical jets are not really pointed at you, but it still is powerful enough to produce um, a lot of radio waves and radio signals, which are coming from the center. And in this case, we refer to this type of a quasar as a radio galaxy. There are several really powerful radio galaxies near us, and they can be easily seen even with um, a typical amateur radio antenna. Now, there's actually a really cool website called Gleemoscope that uses Australian telescopes to allow you to explore the view of the night skies in different perspectives. And here you can take a look at what you would normally see, but in radio waves. And so the same image you just saw would look like this if you were to actually only look at the radio spectrum of the uh, night skies. And notice how some things that are not there in the visible light are actually there in radio light. And that's because there are certain objects, like certain radio galaxies, that are so powerful that we can see them from really, really far away. But we'll talk more about these most powerful radio signals in one of the future videos, so if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure to subscribe. Anyway. So that's quasars, blazers, and radio galaxies. What about pulsars? 
Well, to try to explain what pulsars are and how they're different from all of this, I'm just going to use this simulation. This is basically the uh, most well-known binary pulsar that was discovered um, by these two wonderful gentlemen, Russell Hulse and Joseph Taylor, who even won the Nobel Prize in Physics for their discovery. And what exactly are we looking at here? Well, these are two neutron stars. Very, very small, very dense objects that are producing a lot of energy through accumulation of matter around themselves in a very similar manner to a black hole and then by using a similar mechanism to how astrophysical jets form around black holes neutron stars also create these very powerful jets that can then be seen from really far away and generally speaking uh, most neutron stars that are a pulsar usually have some sort of an object they steal this mass from. Like, for example, another star nearby that transfers all of this mass, allowing the neutron star to power its jets through the interaction with the nearby star, such as this giant right here that you see in the Cygnus X3 system. And over the years, since the original discovery in 1967, we've actually discovered a lot of pulsars. And what we know about them is that, first of all, they're extremely predictable. They don't really change their pattern. The first discovered pulsar only had the pulsation of 1.33 seconds and it hasn't since changed and will probably not change for a very long time. They're more accurate than the most accurate atomic clocks we have on our planet. At the same time, we have so many of them around us that we can technically use them to not just map the galaxy, but also see the interaction of gravitational waves that would not be detectable otherwise. So there are a lot of uses to these pulsars, we just haven't really discovered all of them. Today, a lot of scientists are currently looking into both the use of pulsars in navigation and also the use of uh, pulsars in sciences that require a lot of precision. And in terms of their origins, unlike the black hole emissions coming from quasars, usually all of this starts with a star. Normally, a star that's around at least 8 masses of the Sun to maybe about 25 masses of the Sun that then lives out its life and uh, reaches the point where it can no longer sustain its nuclear reaction and, of course, goes supernova and explodes. Now, we've actually detected such supernova in the last few hundreds of years and the super famous Crab pulsar that you see right there in the middle is actually in the middle of the very well-known Crab Nebula that looks something like this in Space Engine, that is essentially the leftovers from the uh, supernova that exploded approximately a thousand years ago. And what these supernova leave behind is, of course, the remnant, the neutron star. A very dense and very active object that then starts producing pulsations that we can detect from planet Earth. Now, Crab Pulsar is roughly around 11 kilometers in radius, making it somewhat similar in size to the Martian moon Phobos. Really, really small in size, yet very, very dense and extremely massive. The mass here is more than the mass of our sun. The mass here is really, really tiny. And although Phobos is for the most part made out of rock and some ices and stuff, and of course a lot of empty space as well because it's not very dense, the um, mass of neutron stars is almost entirely made out of, well, neutrons. That's why it's called a neutron star. It's basically when the atoms that it was made out of originally became so condensed and so squeezed together that the electrons and the protons literally became one. They became neutrons by being condensed into this material that we now have in the middle of these objects. Now, there are still a lot of things we don't really understand about the inner structure of the neutron stars, but for the most part, we believe that it's mostly neutrons, uh, the same neutrons that we have inside our bodies, except that here it's the result of the actual pressure and the super high density. At the same time, what we know about neutron stars is that some of them spin really, really fast. And when I say really fast, I mean like super fast. If you were to stand on the equator of some of these pulsars, you would be moving at roughly around 10 to maybe even 15% of the speed of light, approximately 30 to 40,000 kilometers per second. And because of this, the pulsations happen really quickly. One of the faster pulsars today makes over 700 orbits every single second. And we refer to these objects as the millisecond pulsars because it takes them less than a second to orbit. And these millisecond pulsars can be extreme. 
here I actually have to slow down time for us to even try to make sense of what's really happening here. And essentially by standing at the equator of these pulsars and by looking up into the night skies, you would be, uh, well, literally seeing the same thing 700 times per second. That's uh, really, really fast. And when the pulsars were originally discovered, we actually thought that at first maybe it was aliens trying to communicate with us because of the repetitiveness of the signals and the extreme precision with which they're made. But it didn't take long for us to actually find theories that explain this without the involvement of the aliens. And what's really interesting is that uh, over the years when we sent out probes like the Pioneer probes and the Voyager probes that we know are going to end up in their interstellar space and might one day be discovered by some crazy alien species out there, actually include the location of the solar system using pulsars. Right here, this image that you're looking at points directly at our solar system using uh, the 14 pulsars we discovered back in 1970s. And they're each identified by their pulsations, as you can see. So a smart enough alien should be able to figure out where all of this came from. Now, we don't really know if it's a good idea to point at our solar system, especially if those aliens are hostile, but it's been done and there's no way for us to recover those records. Anyway, so that's kind of what the pulsars and neutron stars are. And that's, of course, what the quasars, blazars and radio galaxies are. And hopefully this answers the question of what the differences between these objects are to those of you who are not sure. In some of the future videos, we'll discover a few more things about various objects in um, outer space. But for now, that's it. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you still haven't. Share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. And maybe consider supporting this channel on Patreon because, first of all, it does help me quite a lot. But second of all, you do get to ask these questions and I'll make sure to answer them. I'll see you tomorrow. Space out. And as always, bye-bye.